My name is Stephanie Hammond. I'm the head nerd uh, devoted to sales and marketing. Been with Enable for quite a long time. Uh, sales, channel sales, account management. Uh, my last role was as principal account manager for our elite and super elite partners. You can see my contact information there on the screen, uh, my email address. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so if you're on LinkedIn, we should be linked together. And I'm also on Twitter. All right, so let's kick this off. So a common question um, I do get quite regularly, which kind of, you know, got me motivated to do a boot camp on this uh, topic was, how are other MSPs effectively marketing themselves above the competition, you know, for better lead generation and handoff to the sales team? And I wanted to tackle this in a boot camp because I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone that the number one challenge facing MSPs today continues to be around net new customer acquisition and how to get new leads, fresh leads into their organization. And when I talk to partners about this and, and I ask them about their lead gen activities, they often cite that their main source of lead gen has been mainly through word of mouth and, and through referrals. But relying on referrals as your main source of lead gen, it's not a sustainable way to meet your company's growth objectives year over year. As good as referrals are, we really should look at them as a bonus, you know, not a de facto company growth strategy. And so why are MSPs facing this challenge? Why do they continue to face this challenge? I think from speaking to so many partners over the years, it really comes down to two key factors. Um, I think the first one is, is that they are lacking a cohesive marketing strategy um, or, or even the personnel to do the basic set of marketing activities that are needed to find new leads. Um, I think the importance of marketing is often overlooked um, and, and in some cases it's probably not deemed a priority. It's seen as more of an afterthought. And so it's done on a, an inconsistent and ad hoc basis. Or um, they, they're lacking the proper structure needed around the sales motion to generate their own leads. And then, you know, developing a sales process to kind of see those leads through to the end of a signed contract. So although it seems like a simple question, you know, how can I market more effectively to get better leads for my sales uh, people? There's a lot to unpack in that question and hence why I've devoted two uh, entire boot camps to helping you with this important topic. So the objectives of today's session, um, really to focus on lead generation beyond just relying on referrals. Um, so we're gonna go through a, a three-step process and how to effectively market yourself so that you can generate not only new leads for your organization, but more importantly, I wanna focus on how to attract and generate better leads uh, for your organization. All right, so I'm sure everyone has seen this marketing and sales funnel type of image before. We typically refer to it as a sales funnel uh, when we talk about the sales process, but it is much more than just a sales funnel. It actually does start out as a marketing funnel. As we work to use different tactics, different activities to capture as many leads as possible. And then once we have those leads, it then requires effort from both the sales team and the marketing team to kind of work together to nurture those leads. And then it's really up to sales at the end um, to eventually close those leads and convert them into paying uh, clients. But you can see that our funnel um, soon morphs into more of a chalice, you know, after we close the sale, because we then need to ensure that we have the structure, that we have the processes in place to not only maintain those customers that we've signed on, but that we work to strengthen our relationship with those customers so that they become loyal fans and advocates for your organization long term, which is just gonna help continue with the flow of new leads back into the top of the funnel through your word of mouth and referrals. So for today's webinar, we're really gonna focus on the top part of the funnel and we're gonna discuss the importance of proper prospect profiling, conducting thorough market research, because we wanna have the intention of attracting quality leads into your marketing and sales funnel. And you're gonna hear me emphasize that word quality quite a bit throughout today's session because it's so important. In order to grow your business, to take it to the next level, you need to have the right type of quality client. And in order to have the right type of quality client, you want to direct your efforts in the right way that's gonna drive quality leads into your sales funnel. And that can only be accomplished through 
taken the time to properly assess your customer base and your market. Because attracting the right type of client at the beginning, that's what's gonna make it easier to then guide your prospects through the sales funnel. And that's gonna increase the probability that your sales team is then gonna be able to sign them on as a new client in the end. And so step one of our three-step process that we're gonna be talking about today, who do you wanna do business with? Um, looking at some research that was done by uh, salesinsightlab.com, they did a study where they spoke to over 400 salespeople. And they found that 71% of respondents said that at least 50% of the prospects that they were engaged with were not a good fit for what they were selling. So reflecting on this, uh, you know, being a, a former salesperson, it told me that there's a lot of spinning of wheels. There's a lot of wasted time and effort trying to engage and convince businesses to partner with you that aren't necessarily the right type of business in the first place. So the journey of any lead gen push and for better lead gen outcomes, it starts by first focusing on the customer and thinking about the types of organizations that you want to do business with. Because if you can be disciplined and get a good understanding around who you want to target, this is gonna be beneficial in, in several different ways. It's gonna first help you better identify business challenges so that you can better align your services to your prospects, businesses, needs, and pro uh, priorities. It will also help you craft your value proposition. It will help you with your messaging so that your messaging is relevant and it's applicable to the businesses you want to target. And it's gonna help you streamline your sales efforts. It's gonna help increase the velocity in which you can move your prospects through your sales funnel, which is ultimately gonna help improve your close ratios, You know, allowing you to grow faster as a company through increased sales success. So your entire sales efforts and sales success, it starts with first um, doing proper prospect profiling and working on developing your ideal client profile. And you want to look at this ideal client profile as the baseline client type that you set for yourself for your MSP in terms of who you want to target and who you want to do business with moving forward. Because then everything stems from this from a marketing and sales perspective afterwards. So to start, you want to look at your clients, you know, the ones that you're doing business with today. And you really want to think about those good ones that you have. You know, your good customers that you enjoy working with. They're your profitable ones, right? You're the ones that generate healthy monthly recurring revenue for you. You know, they're the ones that are likely enrolled in your whole suite of services that you offer, whether you're a proactive uh, service provider, whether you do fixed fee, whether you're full on uh, cybersecurity, and they're involved in those uh, programs rather than just paying for ad hoc services, a la carte services, or maybe they're just rate fix. And your good customers are those ones who are easy to work with. You know, they, they listen to your recommendations. They value your input. Um, they don't really make any sort of business decision until they consult with you first to see how their technology infrastructure is going to be impacted by whatever the business decision is that they're contemplating. And they likely come to you first before they even go to their accountant, their banker, or their lawyer. Also, your good customers are those who align well with your own company culture and to your own core values. They're the ones who, they still show you and your team respect, even when there's a difference in opinions or something has gone wrong. And your good customers are those who value your services and they appreciate the relationship that you have cultivated with them over the years. You know, your good customers are the ones who recognize quality and they're willing to pay a proper fee for services because they recognize that their network security, um, the, their performance, that is what's instrumental to their ongoing success of their business. So step one of any quality lead generation plan is to first determine who your ideal client is going to be. And you can start this process um, just by looking internally and looking at your own clients. Um, and so to do this customer segmentation exercise, uh, it can be done very simply. You just open an Excel spreadsheet uh, and you start listing out uh, all of your clients uh, on that spreadsheet. Because the goal of this exercise upon completion is to help you to discern you know, the characteristics that you consider to be ideal when it comes time to targeting you know, new businesses that 
you're going to make part of your overall marketing strategy when we get to step three. And, you know, we talk about a lot, um, you know, if you've attended my, uh, uh, the guide to building to building and selling security programs, you know, we talk about having and enforcing a minimum baseline standard for programs. We talk about enforcing a technological baseline standard for your business. And just as, as it is as important to uh, create and enforce a technological baseline standard, it's just as important to create and enforce an acceptable client baseline standard for your organization. And this information is gonna be beneficial because it's gonna help you then craft your value prop statements. It's gonna help you create good messaging when you're beginning to develop your lead gen strategy, when you're beginning to develop you know, future marketing campaigns, because you're gonna be able to create messaging that's gonna resonate with your target audience who you're going after. And they're gonna recognize that you're speaking directly to them. And that's what's gonna motivate them to reach out and discuss your offerings further with you because they're gonna get that sense that you understand them and that you understand their business and their industry. So once you have your spreadsheet, Column A, you've listed out all of your other, uh, all of your clients. How do we populate the rest of our spreadsheets? So this is what you're seeing here. You know, what are some other uh, basic data you want to populate in this spreadsheet? Um, so I've tried to make this list as exhaustive as possible. Um, if you want, take a screenshot to, of this so that you have it. But looking at basic information, like obviously your, your customer name, what city are they in? What state are they in? Um, how many locations uh, do they have? Um, how many employees do they have in total? Uh, do they have internal IT resources in-house? And when I talk about internal IT resources, I mean real, real IT people, you know, not an office manager who knows how to, you know, get printer, uh, the printer unstuck, or they know how to spell IT. It's, it's real internal, you know, desktop uh, admin type people. Uh, what MSP program level are they under with you? You know, are they time material? Are they in a la carte? Are they in proactive? Are they in fixed fee? Are they in your full on cybersecurity program? And then how much are they spending each month on services with you on a recurring basis? Looking at what industry they're in, you know, what vertical are they in? Um, what uh, do they happen to fall under any sort of compliance uh, standards or compliance requirements? And if they do, what regulations do they fall under? You know, are there any critical business activities that you need to note? And I think this is a really important concept to start focusing on because, you know, we're talking with non-technical people. Uh, we're talking with business owners. Um, so I think it's a topic when we talk about critical business activities that prospects inherently understand. And so when we think about, you know, a critical business activity, we define that as a business function that an employee or a group of employee performs on a daily basis. So if we use maybe a sales team uh, as an example, you know, when you look at the sales team of organization, they're responsible for growing the revenues of the business. And they do this through winning new sales, bringing on new clients, uh, upselling, cross-selling uh, with existing clients. And in order to do all of this and to be successful, they have to have regular and ongoing outreach and discussions with prospects and customers. And they're using a variety of communication methods like phone, um, Teams, go to webinar, um, Zoom, WebEx, uh, to speak with their clients and hold their meetings. And so because of all of this, they're likely using a variety of different software packages um, to do this. They're probably using a variety of different software packages to track customer information and where they currently are in the buying process and the sales process with them. So thinking of what the sales team does in a day, what would happen if that sales team lost their email and phone capabilities, or if they lost their ability to connect with their customers and their prospects? You know, what would happen if they lost their customer contact information or all of their client engagement notes? Um, you know, back in the day when I was in sales and I managed, you know, all my territories, you know, I had 100, 125 partners per territory. There wasn't any way I could keep all my conversations tracked in my head properly. So I had to put everything into Salesforce. And if I did not have Salesforce for that day or if it was down, I, in effect, could not hold quality meetings because all of my notes were, were in Salesforce. And so you want to think of that. You know, what's the impact of that? Um, what would happen if the sales team lost the ability to create quotes? or to submit orders. So looking at things like email communication, phone communication, 
uh, data entry, presentation delivery, quoting, submitting orders. These are all considered critical business activities for that organization. And then looking at what key applications are they using and that they rely upon to you know, perform and conduct all these critical business activities. And so identifying what these key applications are, that's gonna help highlight you know, kind of what those technical tidbits are on the back end that support these applications. And it's gonna help identify the devices and the potential service offerings that are needed so that you can ensure for them uptime, reliability, and stability you know, for these critical business activities. And then do you know about any specific business requirements? Um, and then why they might have some of these, these typical requirements. Um, are you aware of any specific business challenges, struggles, um, maybe because of the industry that they happen to be in? You know, how do they view their technology infrastructure? You know, how dependent are they on their technology infrastructure? You know, is there a pain whenever they happen to experience downtime? And I think with this, um, it works best to give it a rating. You know, so do they view their technology infrastructure as being strategic to their business? Like, are they heavily reliant on their network? If they are, I would give it a high rating. Or does the customer regard their technology as that necessary evil? And they're cursing you every time they need to call you and pay you to come out and fix something. I would probably give them a low rating. Or are they somewhere in between? You know, the three can give them a medium rating. You know, do they have a budget in place for IT spending each year? You know, kind of yes or no. Um, and I feel this one's really important because if they don't have an IT budget, um, then you're not doing your due diligence as an MSP. And um, if they're if they're fighting you on that, these are definitely not clients. It's a red flag. You, you definitely don't want to have them as clients because they don't view their network as being important to the success of their business if they can't even put a line item in their annual budget for it. Um, looking at their security sensitivities, do they have any? Um, maybe they do because of the vertical that they're in. And I think, again, giving them a rating of high, medium, and low works really well here. How would you classify their overall business risk as it relates to the value of their data? You know, how bad of an impact would it be to their organization if their organization was breached or if it was exposed to a ransomware attack? Again, give it a rating, high, medium, or low. Um, is your customer in a competitive market landscape? You know, are they a dental office and there's a lot of other dental offices in your target area? Or maybe they're a manufacturer and they're, they're the sole business, the sole manufacturer in that industry in your area. Has your customer been growing? You know, have they been adding new employees, opening new locations, buying new hardware, investing in new services from you? Or have they been shrinking? Have they been closing locations, laying off employees? And do you feel that their network meets your minimum acceptable standards? Again, we talk about you should have for your MSP baseline technical standards for all of your customers that they must meet. So do you have customers that meet that? Yes or no. And then I thought it might be helpful to also add kind of an overall customer rating to your profiling worksheet and then rate your customers on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being that they are a very difficult client to work with you would fire them in a heartbeat if you could, whereas 10 is, they're a fantastic customer to work with. You have a great working relationship and you would love to have 50 more of these types of customers in your base. So I'm sure that maybe some of you, as you're sitting there listening to me talk about this, you might be thinking, this sounds like a lot of work, Steph. You know, where am I going to find this type of, of data to complete my worksheet? Um, I'm not gonna lie, it is not going to be a quick and easy exercise to complete, but the more effort that you can put into conducting this type of market research upfront, the better the results you're gonna have in achieving the sales success that you're looking for. It is gonna net you higher quality leads that are gonna be added to the top of your sales funnel. And that's really the goal you know, of this week is with lead gen, you know, our goal is to get quality leads. We don't want to attract and waste our time on the 50% of prospects who aren't and will never be a good fit for your services. And you don't even want them as a client anyways. So what are some ideas on where you can go out and collect the data that you need to complete this worksheet? I think the easiest way is just to go talk to your clients, you know, survey them, uh, maybe call them, do a video conference, uh, take them out to lunch, take them out for a coffee, 
and, and just speak candidly with them about what you're trying to achieve. You know, your customers are always willing and wanting to help you. And so you want to ask your good clients when you're speaking with them, you know, why do they continue to stay loyal to you? Um, in their mind, what do you do better? What do you do well that sets you apart from your competitors? You know, how instrumental in supporting their business have you been? You know, what sort of business problems have you been able to solve for them? You know, what technical problems have you been able to solve for them? Um, why do they even have the technology that they do? And, and what's the impact that that technology has on their business, especially if it fails? And, you know, maybe for the technology part, you know, your customers might not be able to, you know, explain or properly articulate, but you can get that information from your ticketing system. You know, there's a wealth of information contained in your ticketing system if you just take the time to look at it. You know, are there multiple issues that seem to be common among several customers that might be in the same vertical? Also go and look at your closed one deals that you might have in your PSA or in your CRM. You know, hopefully there's good notes in there around the sales process and what challenges, you know, were presented by those prospects um, that you were ultimately able to help them overcome so that you actually won them as a new client. Because again, the goal here, we want to get a good understanding of your customers and why they make the business decisions that they do and to get a good understanding around how you've helped them and how you've benefited uh, their business. But if the customer isn't, you know, again, able to adequately or articulate their, their issues or their challenges, there are other ways that you can research uh, their industry to find out what sort of challenges they might be facing that you can use as well. So looking at um, industry uh, forums, looking at subreddits, um, I think subreddits is a, a great resource to really help identify pain points um, and, and any other of those other, you know, kind of open web-based um, type of forums. Because in these forums, users will often ask questions related to their business and they will get instant feedback from their peers. And so going out and reading those posts, that's going to provide you with the insight into what the exact challenges are that your customers are facing in that particular vertical and find out how their peers are addressing those challenges. And then you also want to look at industry publications, industry blogs, you know, find blogs and magazines that focus on the industry that you're thinking of targeting and then read everything that you can. Again, big benefits if you can put the effort into doing this type of research because you're then going to be able to use this data and that's going to form the foundation of your marketing strategy when you're ready so that you can target other like-minded organizations. Because for optimal and sustained growth, we want to make sure that we're only adding good clients to your base. You know, it is really important to be intentional in who you target to do business with. You know, leave those poor ones, leave those weaker ones behind for, for someone else. And um, there's a, a good example that I want to talk about of a partner of mine. Um, they were part of my, my base for several years when I was an account manager for the elites. And they did this exact exercise. Uh, they completed, if, I think they told me it took close to six to nine months, but they completed this profiling exercise uh, a few years ago. Their original database had about 2000 customers in it. And they did a thorough profiling exercise on all 2000 of these clients, you know, using the criteria that I, I, I spoke about previously. It took them some time, but in the end, they ended up whittling their database down to 125 customers that they actually like and that they actually enjoy doing business with and who are profitable uh, for them. And so now this forms the foundation for any new prospecting that they do from either a sales or for a marketing perspective. And so because of this exercise, they're now very deliberate and intentional in who they target and, they alt and, and who they decide to ultimately do business with. And so because of all of this, they now have a great uh, subset of clients who wholeheartedly support them. Um, like talk about raving fans and having a loyal base of clients. And so when it comes to referrals and word of mouth, any new referrals that they receive, they tend to be the same high quality standards as those customers that made the cut. So good clients beget good prospects which helped provide that fresh new leads at the top of the marketing funnel. So it was a, a long, extensive exercise, uh, but they, it worked out and it's working incredibly well for them. It was a good learning experience for sure. 
So once you've completed your ideal client profile worksheet, hopefully there are some significant findings that will jump out at you that will help guide you in creating your own ideal client profile for your organization that everyone in sales and marketing can rally around. So here we want to look at, you know, what are the commonalities that are going to pop out at you? And so we look at location, you know, are most of your customers local? Um, is, is that what you want? Or are you looking to expand? You know, maybe you want to go further into the state, maybe nationwide, maybe globally. Looking at the employee size and looking at the number of IT resources internally. Um, are you supporting a lot of small and medium sized businesses who don't have any internal IT resources? Or have you found that you're playing more in the mid market space, you know, where there are some dedicated uh, internal uh, people and you're supporting them with some co managed or supplemental services? And then which client type do you prefer to support? You know, do you like working with the mid enterprise and working with the internal IT and collaborating with them? Or do you like being kind of that outsource IT for businesses that don't have anybody internally? Looking at the MSP program type, you know, which program type do most of your customers fall in? And is that by design or is that by happenstance? Which program type would you prefer your customers be in and that you standardize them on? And then looking at industry, are there any predominant verticals that stand out that you're servicing? You know, and do any of these verticals have any compliance requirements? Because if you have the skills to support these types of verticals, then that makes them a great fit for you to promote, you know, your cybersecurity services and your abilities to. You know, high dependency and reliance on IT. You know, you want clients that view their network infrastructure from a strategic standpoint and who recognize that there is a heavy reliance on their IT network. And you want them to acknowledge and experience you know, great pain when they do have any sort of, of network downtime. So the more reliant on IT they are, the better the fit they are for your services. And then looking at their business risk and their security sensitivities, you know, is the data that the business collecting, is it seen as being highly valuable? If so, these are great types of organizations to target because the impact of a data breach, that could be catastrophic for them. So you can provide value information via your marketing around how you can help your existing customers really protect, you know, what's known as their crown jewels, you know, their data, the most important asset they have for their business outside of their employees. And then again, going back to do they have an IT budget in place? You always want to ensure that businesses you partner with, that you work with, that you take on as clients, include IT spending as part of their annual budgets that they create. If they don't budget for IT and they won't allow you to work with them uh, to include line items for IT spending in future budgets, red flag, I wouldn't be accepting them on as clients. Because once they become a client, you know, looking back at our chalice, you're going to continue to have ongoing relationships with these organizations. You're going to have executive business reviews with them every quarter, you know, maybe twice a year, depending on their size. And you're going to be reviewing with them their IT budget and their proposed IT spending. And so if they're against this or if they're kind of wishy-washy and they're not going to allow you to do that, then again, you don't want them as a client. Looking at their business struggles, looking at their challenges, you know, are there businesses that seem to have the same set of business challenges and maybe you've devised a way to help them overcome these challenges and you can use that and promote it in your marketing. Looking at their market growth potential, you know, obviously, you know, we want to target businesses that are in growing industries, you know, they're, they're opening new locations, they're hiring people, and we want to avoid targeting businesses that are laying employees off, or maybe they're closing locations um, because of a shrinking market. Looking at, you know, how acceptable um, does their network or does their network meet your acceptable baseline standards? Uh, again, I think this really works to reflect on the value of the partnership that they have with you. You know, if they continue to invest in their network as they make recommendations, you want more of those types of customers because it demonstrates that they view their network as fundamental to their success and they respect you as the authority figure around that. And then looking at your overall customer rating, you know, who are your eights, who are your nines, who are your tens? Go back and then review all of the other characteristics to see why you have rated them so high. Who are your fives, your fours, your threes? Again, look at those characteristics to see why you've rated them so low. We want to aim to attract tens and we want to remove our fives. 
um, from your customer base because those are the ones that are draining of your time, your energy and resources. Yes, you might be getting a little bit of money from them each month, but turning them all in and spending that time going after more tens is going to be more beneficial to your organization. And then next, you know, we've done this. Are there any gaps that could potentially be new marketing and sales opportunities for you? So we're looking at gaps as, you know, examining your market landscape. Are there any new verticals or new industries that you can target? You know, obviously targeting new businesses in verticals that you're already currently working with. Great approach, makes sense. But is there a market that's being underserviced that might provide additional sales opportunities for you? You know, is there a subset of businesses that aren't being targeted at all? You know, is there a market or is there a vertical that you would like to go deeper into? Maybe you have a couple of customers in, in one particular market or one particular vertical already, and you have a really good relationship with them. Could you use these customers as a springboard maybe ask them for a reference so that you can then expand your reach into other businesses in that same market. Uh, so now looking at step two, um, step two of our journey to attract better quality leads into your market marketing pipeline. It's all focused on making sure you're crafting the right messaging. And so once you've identified, you know, who you want to do business with and which verticals you want to target, we then need to start looking at crafting our messaging and, and constructing a value prop statement and building out our brand so that we can create awareness out in the marketplace. And the design of your overall messaging, that starts right at the top. You know, that starts at the executive uh, level, at the executive leadership level, because it should reflect the company culture and the way that you do business. And I have a partner that's been a partner of ours since 2005. Um, I've had them uh, as a partner in my base uh, on and on throughout the years. And several years ago, they went full force into marketing. Um, and, and I would consider them MSP power marketers at this point. But it started by they implemented the role of chief brand officer in their organization because they took marketing and its role that it plays in the growth of their MSP so seriously. And now everything that that organization does from a marketing and sales perspective, it has to be signed off by her as the chief brand officer because she works to make sure it stays on brand and it's on messaging. She works really hard to make sure nobody goes rogue in terms of what they post out on social. Um, it all has to get approved by her. And so really, you know, when we look at message creation, it starts by first defining your company's vision and your company's mission statement. And so when we look at your company's vision statements, this is aspirational. This is based on your organization's longer term goals and, and objectives. You know, a vision statement is what it sounds. It's, it's visionary. While a mission statement, this is the roadmap of how your business is going to work to achieve your organization's vision. It defines the core purpose of your organization. And you can really think of a mission statement as being that actionary, you know, action, action oriented. And then once you have your vision and mission statements defined at the company level, you can then begin working on your messaging on a more tactical level. And that starts with building out your value proposition statement. And your value proposition statement, that's a summation of how your services will help solve problems and challenges being experienced by your target audience and how you are gonna do that better than any other competitor in the marketplace. Now, as I'm speaking, you might be thinking this sounds like a lot of fluff, um, but building out your value prop statement should not be taken lightly. Um, I really do encourage you, if you've never done anything like this before, spend time working on this because crafting a unique and compelling value prop statement, that's what's going to help set you apart from your competitors. And that's your opportunity to really differentiate yourself and articulate why an organization should partner with you as opposed to engaging with someone else. Because having a strong value prop statement that's prominent in your marketing material, uh, that's prominent on your website, uh, on your social, is one of the most important factors in converting prospects into customers. And there's gonna be an exercise that we're gonna go through momentarily that I hope really drives home this point. Um, but there was a, a study that was done by Quick Sprout, uh, they're a marketing company, and they found that 54% of companies they don't do anything 
to optimize their value prop statements. They wrote something because they felt they needed to, they threw it up on their website, it was poorly written, poorly defined. And when you do that, it's actually gonna cause you to lose any prospects and kill any sales opportunities that you may have. And again, we have an exercise I'm gonna go through momentarily that I hope kind of drives that point, uh, that point home. So how do you actually write a good value prop statement? So you wanna start by first identifying how your services will help solve your prospects specific problems. And this is where taking a verticalized approach is gonna work really well here. You know, think of your you know, desired industry, uh, your desired vertical that you wanna target with your messaging. And then recall from your research from step one, you know, those key business challenges and struggles that they're facing. And then you want to consider, you know, what are the benefits that your services offer to those prospects? You know, if you're able to help solve for those problems, what will that, that allow them to do? You know, what are the outcomes that they can expect from enrolling in your services? And so, again, thinking back to those great customers that you've been supporting for, you know, an extended period of time, you know, those who are your raving fans of your organization. You know, think of how you have helped them and how you've benefited their business. And then think about how do you do things differently from other MSPs in this space? How are you different? What sets you apart from other MSPs in the area or in your industry? You know, why are you the best choice for their business? And for this exercise, you want to brainstorm and maybe come up with three or four things that make you stand out above the rest. This could be something you know, about your vertical spo uh, focus, your vertical speciality. Um, it could be something about your years of service, your years of experience. Um, maybe there's some business awards or nominations uh, that you've earned. So really, as I'm saying, don't take this task lightly. Spend some time creating a good value prop statement for your business and for your website. Um, so I'm just showing you some, some quick tips here. But I think uh, what's really important is the last step, test your message. You know, once you have it crafted, be sure to test it out with, with others to gauge that emotional response to it. Set up a focus group, you know, with maybe some good customers, maybe with some employees, maybe with some key prospects that you're working with. Um, if you have some inner circle of friends, if you have good uh, business acquaintances, um, some, uh, or even some mentors, some coaches that you're working with ask for their opinion, role play that if they were a business owner and they saw your value prop on your website, would it cause them to reach out and, and call you? Or would they quickly pass, make a stop decision and uh, hit that back button to continue their search for another MSP? All right, so just to recap what we've done so far. Uh, step one, we worked on identifying the types of customers we wanted to do business with and the specific verticals we wanted to target. We created that ideal client profile that we want to pursue with our marketing and sales efforts so that we can get new business into our sales funnel. Step two, we then covered how to create a good value proposition statement um, we talked about you know, researching what your target audience pain points are, determining how you can best solve for those business challenges better than your competitors. And this was all summarized in a concise and cohesive message that resonated with your focus group of key stakeholders that you then went and tested that on. And so moving into step three, uh, this is definitely going to be a lot of information um, coming at this step because we wanna use the work that we've done in steps one and two and use all of that to start building on our marketing strategy and our marketing plan. Because again, our goal with all of this is we wanna build awareness, we wanna build interest in our desired target audience so that we can generate more leads flowing into the top of our marketing funnel. But first, you know, one thing that I wanted to address is I do get this question asked um, quite a bit is, you know, what's a reasonable marketing budget that I should set for my MSP? So trying to do some research on this, um, I found uh, some, some stats. The US Small Business Administration, they recommend spending anywhere from seven to 8% of your gross revenue on marketing and advertising. If you're doing less than $5 million a year in sales, and if your net profit margin after all expenses is in the 10 to 12% range. There was other marketing experts out there um, you know, that suggested that startups and small businesses allocate only two to 
of gross revenue for marketing and advertising. And then I came across other experts who suggested a much wider range between one to 10% or more, depending on how long the business has been around and how competitive your market is. So not really able to pin down a precise number. But at the end of the day, I think there's a couple of factors that you want to consider when setting up your marketing budget. Obviously, the first is, is what's your annual gross revenue? Because we obviously have to have money coming in. Um, and then secondly, how long have you been in business? You know, are you a new MSP, meaning that you've been in business less than five years? Are you an established MSP where you've been in the business for more than five years and you have some good uh, market share that you've been able to capture so far? Because typically new companies, you know, they're the ones that need to have the higher uh, percentage devoted to marketing, you know, because they're the ones who are trying to establish their brand and gain the loyal customers out in the marketplace. Because at this point, businesses don't know that you exist and word of mouth can only do so much. So marketing should be a major focus for younger companies in order to bring in new customers, new leads and to help establish your company in your industry. Then once you know that your brand is, is established, you have some market share, you can then look at reviewing your metrics to see if it makes sense to now maybe look at reducing your marketing budget. So for those new companies, new MSPs, it's recommended that at least 12 to 20% of your gross revenue should be allocated uh, to marketing. And then for established companies, the thought is that they can have a lower marketing budget because they're more of an established company. And so their brand doesn't need to market as heavily. They have a loyal base of customers as their foundation who really aren't going anywhere. And so while they still need to market, they certainly don't need to allocate as many resources as maybe a, a smaller company does. And so for established companies, they feel that you can get away with between maybe six to 12% um, of your uh, gross revenue to be allocated to marketing. And I, you know, tried to get some, some more definitive numbers, you know, for MSP specifically. So I did an informal poll uh, a few months back um, on my Twitter, on my LinkedIn to see what I could get. And it wasn't helpful. I got a huge range of numbers as well. Um, but generally from my poll, MSPs were allocating anywhere from five to 15% of annual gross revenues uh, towards marketing. So as much as I tried, um, there isn't really kind of a magic number that I can recommend. Um, it really depends on what your priority is and how quickly you want to get out there and try and establish your brand and, and capture market share. Um, but at least, you know, it gives you kind of a, 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 a starting point. But I think the the bigger takeaway is it's important to kind of measure and then tweak, you know, your marketing budget from there, depending on your success and your outcomes. Um, and the question came in, you know, what is the average cost per lead in our industry? Oh, goodness, Melanie, I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, let me let me do some research. And uh, that's an excellent question um, to, to see. I, I have a feeling like it is trying to establish a reasonable marketing budget. It's really going to depend on, you know, all of those activities that you're putting into it, you know, um, you know, from a marketing perspective and then putting in, you know, are you, are you leveraging salespeople to kind of help with your leads as well? Cause marketing is only one side of the coin, you know, doing your marketing, um, is, is one side, but the other side is using people to also reach out and make connections and try and get leads, uh, that way. So leave that with me and I'll take it away. Um, in these marketing budget numbers, does that include the cost of the marketing headcount? Yes, it does. Uh, in that it has the marketing person in there, which I think really is contributing to the wide range. Um, because obviously if you have a dedicated marketing person, then that's going to be factored into the marketing budget. You need to include that headcount uh, in that, in that budget. So good questions. Thank you. So developing a marketing strategy versus developing a marketing plan. Um, I think these two terms tend to get used interchangeably, um, but there is a difference um, between what is a marketing strategy versus what is a marketing plan. Because various, you know, one-off, you know, sporadic marketing activities like, you know, posting to LinkedIn every once in a while, 
sending out an email, maybe a newsletter once a quarter, making a call, that's not a strategy. Your marketing strategy is born out of whatever your overall marketing goals and objectives are for your organization. So before you can really begin to formulate your marketing strategy, you first need to, you know, kind of document down on paper, you know, what are your goals? What are you looking to achieve with your marketing? Because marketing fundamentally, it's a relationship building tool. And it's a tool that you as a business owner, you utilize to help you achieve the lifestyle that you want to live. You know, as business owners, you want to grow the business and so that you can sell and retire comfortably. But to grow the business, you need to bring on new clients. To grow the business, you need to retain and expand the sales with existing clients. And marketing is what you use to kind of help achieve and accomplish all of this. And that's really what the essence and the purpose of marketing is. So once you've outlined what your marketing goals are, your marketing plan is then all of those different tactics, those different activities that you're going to utilize in a holistic uh, and methodical manner to achieve those marketing goals that you've set for yourself. So the plan is around how you're going to implement that strategy. So filling the funnel, you know, keeping in mind, you know, what our overarching marketing goal of this bootcamp is today. We want to build awareness of your MSP within your targeted audience to attract net new high quality leads into your marketing and sales funnel. So we want to spend some time reviewing the different marketing approaches that are available and the different tactics to consider implementing when constructing your marketing plan. And so we look at, you know, filling that top of the funnel with leads, kicking off that whole process. There's really a two prong approach that you want your marketing to consist of. What are you doing from an online digital marketing standpoint? Um, so that you can spread the word, build awareness about your company using, you know, the internet, you know, online. And then what are you doing from that traditional or from that direct marketing standpoint to build awareness of your company and your brand in your local area? So things like print ads, radio ads, direct mail, postcards, event marketing, all that kind of stuff. Both approaches are necessary to help you generate the leads for your MSP. There isn't one approach, there isn't one tactic, there isn't one activity that's gonna be better than the rest. Um, successful marketers, you know, the powerhouse marketers, um, best in class MSPs, they will all tell you that there isn't just one way to attract leads. Um, it's going to be really a combination of a variety of tactics, you know, using a combination of both traditional and digital marketing activities that are going to be centered around building that interest and awareness of your MSP within your target audience. And then really testing to see which combination of tactics is going to work the best or does work the best in getting you the results that you want. So for the majority of today's session or for the remaining 50 minutes of it or so, we're going to be focused on building out your online digital marketing strategy. Um, because according to, uh, there was a survey done by salesforce.com, 87% of business owners stated that when buying, um, when a buying trigger presented itself, they turned to Google first. They went to the internet first to start conducting their research on that potential new vendor that they were looking to partner with. And there was a Gartner study that said that today's buyers spend about two thirds of their buying journey researching, gathering, processing information that they source themselves using online means and much of this learning happens without ever speaking to a sales rep. And so I feel these stats are really critical in that they convey how important building and implementing a digital marketing strategy is for building awareness within your target market to help you generate leads for your MSP. Because these stats tell us that prospects, they're basing their decisions about whether to even engage with you or not based solely on what the internet was telling them or not telling them if you're an MSP that doesn't really have an online presence. So it is very important in this day and age to cultivate a cohesive online marketing presence because having that online presence, that's just gonna complement, that's gonna help prop up and help support any direct or traditional marketing approaches that you also decide to undertake and implement simultaneously. And so there's a variety of different online marketing approaches that you can use that can let, uh, to help fill uh, your funnel. Um, I have some listed here, uh, content marketing. This is all about creating and distributing timely, 
valuable, relevant content so that you can attract and maintain your targeted audience. So here we're looking at things like blog articles, white papers, eBooks, FAQs, checklists, videos, that type of thing. Social media marketing. Again, if you haven't yet, we need to embrace social media as a marketing platform because that is essential in helping to promote and build awareness for your business. Um, I think the easiest platform to start off on and use would be LinkedIn. Um, I know I get you know partners that will say, well, what about Facebook? What about Twitter? I think if you're starting out, um, and I think we were almost more than 50% uh, were, were contemplating it or starting out or doing it ad hoc, you want to do something manageable. There's a lot of different platforms that are out there. Um, and I think to keep it manageable, manageable to start, just focusing on one, and that would be LinkedIn. Um, and on your LinkedIn, on your social, this is where you can share the content that you're creating from your content marketing, like your blog posts, like your customer testimonials, that might appeal to your target audience. Uh, there's email marketing. And this is obviously digital marketing of sending out emails to prospects and customers on a regular ongoing basis. Uh, we have SEO marketing. You know, this is really the practice of using the right keywords, headlines, and content uh, to help businesses find your services when they do an internet search. Uh, advertising, you know, we know the pay-per-click, right? You know, where you pay for each click that you receive on an ad that you create. And if you are just starting out, I'm in no way saying that you need to implement all of these different uh, approaches out of the gate. Um, actually, for anybody listening, if you attended our virtual empower event last year, we had Paul Green. Um, he presented to our partners about what his recommended approach to marketing is that he teaches his MSPs. And if you're not familiar who Paul Green is, please look him up. Um, he's an MSP marketing consultant. He runs his own company out of the UK. Uh, called Paul Green's MSPMarketing.com. He works exclusively with MSPs, helping them to market and grow their business. Um, he offers so much free content out there uh, on his website. He does podcasts. Um, he does training events. So many good, um, good information, great information that you can glean from that. But anyway, when he presented to our partners in his session, he shared his three-step process for marketing that he felt MSPs should follow. And step one of his process was cultivating that online marketing presence. Um, he feels that MSPs should be focused on building up multiple audiences where you have business owners listening to you. And he specifically mentions that MSPs should be leveraging uh, social like LinkedIn to build up their social audiences. And they should also be focusing on building up their email database and engaging in email marketing. And he was especially passionate about building out and maintaining your email uh, marketing database because he feels that the number one marketing channel for B2B services is and will continue to be email um, because business owners, decision makers, they still use and rely on email as their primary communication vehicle, uh, even with everything else that's coming out there today. But before you can really begin using any of these approaches, the first thing you need to do is to ensure that your website is modern and up to date because there really is no use in doing any of these marketing activities if your website is not the very best that it can be. And so you wanna make sure to make your website count. It is your very best lead generator. It is your 24 by seven by 365 salesperson. It is the first impression a prospect gets of your MSP. You know, hopefully that was evident um, just in the, our little value prop um, exercise that we, we went by. Um, because of that, it should be your number one marketing priority if you know that your website can use some work um, at the moment. Because MSPs are fighting what Paul, if you've ever heard him speak or listened to one of his podcasts or webinars, inertia loyalty. It takes a lot of uh, it, it, it takes a lot for businesses to switch MSP providers. But if a business starts to consider the possibility of switching MSP providers, your website is the very first place that they're gonna start looking um, if they're starting to search uh, for a new provider. And you're gonna lose any and all credibility and any authority with your prospects. They are gonna make snap, uh, snap judgments about your skill sets, uh, about your competencies, if they go to your website while they're doing their research 
and your website appears old, if it has outdated content on it, like old articles, old blog posts, you know, if your website looks like it's been forgotten about it or forgotten about, that's not a good thing. Because when visitors see things like this, they're going to be turned off. You know, they're going to quickly decide that, you know, if you can't be bothered to keep your website up to date, then they're going to assume that that's a reflection of how you manage your business uh, as a whole. And they may make that snap decision that you're not the right MSP for them. And they're going to hit the back button and they're going to continue their search. You know, again, going back to it takes about half a second for users to form an opinion about your website um, around whether they're going to stay on your website and poke around or whether they're going to leave. And 75% of users uh, admit to making judgments about a company's credibility based purely on how the website looks and functions. So you want to make sure that your website is easy to read, that it, you can navigate it without any problems, that it's error free, that there's no broken links or 404 uh, errors, um, that it contains a really good, clear value proposition around how you help businesses, that has clear call to actions to encourage prospects to reach out. And I think most importantly now, I think this is more critical than anything, is that it's mobile friendly. Um, there's nothing more frustrating then looking up or doing some research on your phone and you have to scroll or you have to pinch or you, it, it doesn't load properly. You know, you have to make sure in this day and age that your website is mobile friendly because a lot of the times, like I can have my computer, I can have my iPad and my phone. It's the phone that I pick up first <laughs> when I go into Chrome. So you want to make sure that your website is mobile friendly. So due to the limitations uh, for today's session, I'm not going into an in-depth review of what you should do to improve your website, but we have a lot of good resources I wanna direct you to. Um, our MSP Institute does have some great on-demand videos around how to build um, a good website, what makes for a good website, so I encourage you to log in and check that out. Um, if you do feel that your website could use a good refresher. Um, I also want to encourage you to check out our Enable Technology Alliance program. Uh, we call it TAP uh, for short, um, because on there we have a company that we vetted uh, called Wisecurve, uh, and they offer, Mark Coltman, who's the owner, offers website review consulting services and some one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and he also kind of has a self-service, um, self-study website success 101 program to give you suggestions on how to improve the functionality of your website so that you can keep prospects engaged and encourage them to reach out and, and connect. Um, and I actually had an interview and did a, an office hours with Mark uh, from Wisecurve. And in that office hours, he went through you know, common mistakes to avoid when creating your website, um, tips he provided. And he also did live website reviews, I think of five or six different partners um, and went through their websites and gave suggestions and recommendations on what needed to be uh, improved to better get that client engagement and to get that client conversion. And so that office hours was recorded and it was posted into my section of the MSP Institute. So if you wanna hear it, and I would encourage you all to go and listen to it if, if you know your website can use some work, go into the MSP Institute, uh, scroll down until you see the head nerd section, click on my, my picture, and then you'll see actually all of my boot camps there that I've recorded to date. And then look for the one that says common mistakes to avoid when creating your website. It's about an hour long, uh, um, uh, recording, but again, it's it's 100% focused to what you should do to make your website um, better in, in terms of client engagement and and uh, conversion. So really, I think what my whole point is about your website is if you recognize that you do fall into that camp of goodness, my website could use some work. Go to the professionals, you know, have them work with you uh, on it, even if you feel that you can do it yourself. If you could, you would have by now, um, not, to, not to mince words or, or be too harsh. Um, so if you do have like any money devoted to marketing, if your website needs some help, put it into your website first. All right, so assuming your website is good to go, uh, it's been updated, it's engaging, you know, where do you now start when it comes to building out the actual marketing plan? And so using Paul's idea where he feels that your, your digital marketing plan, because we're just focusing on the digital side for this uh, session, 
He feels it should be focused on developing two main audiences. Work on developing your social audience and then work on developing your email marketing audience. And I do think that's a really sensible and manageable approach when starting to build out your plan. Um, again, especially to the 50% uh, plus that they're starting to work on it or it's ad hoc um, at the moment. And so let's start with building out your social media marketing plan. You know, over the last five years or so, um, and then obviously with this ongoing pandemic, we did see a real shift occur in the buyer's journey and how buyers are making their purchasing decisions today. One of the biggest changes that we saw happen was that people were going more and more online to do their research when they realized that they needed to buy something. They started with Google to see what their options were, and then they went to websites, and then they went to reading reviews, and then they went to look at companies' social feeds. And going back to that Gartner stat again, that you know, by the time a buyer actually reaches out to engage with an actual salesperson at a company, they're already two thirds of their way through to making their purchasing decision because of all the research that they've conducted by themselves using online means. So salespeople, they're not as critical in the overall sales process as they once were because of the rise of quality information and the content that buyers can source from themselves from the web. And if maybe you are a little skeptical um, that being on social media will actually work to help create leads for your MSP, uh, there was a survey that was conducted by Ignite Visibility and it found that 90% of marketers that they surveyed said that their social media marketing efforts actually increased exposure for their business. Um, and 75% said that social media presence has increased traffic to their website. And that's really the biggest benefits of using social media is using it to drive visitors to your website to find out more about your organization. And then it's your website that starts the conversation and motivates them to reach out and contact you for a live engagement. And that's why I keep stressing and will continue to stress how important it is to ensure that your website is modern and up to date um, and, and taking care of that first before starting any of these other marketing activities. And one of the questions I often um, get asked is, you know, when it comes to social media marketing, you know, what's the best social platform to be on? And I think the easiest and the best answer that I can give is, you know, be on the ones where your customers are. And as I've kind of alluded to, for B2B selling, consensus is it's LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn is the best platform to be active on and to use to help build out your audience of business owners who are listening to you. And HubSpot, you know, who's our, you know, the biggest marketing automation platform out there in the market, they believe that LinkedIn is three times better than Facebook and Twitter when it comes to leads and lead conversions. And think about it, you know, LinkedIn is basically the most up-to-date, publicly accessible database out there today. It contains virtually, you know, every lead you could ever want to speak to. You just need to really learn how to navigate and how to leverage it to get it working for you if this is something that you're not active on today. And so when I talk about LinkedIn and social media marketing and, and lead gen, there's a really good book that I recommend to MSPs who are interested in leveraging LinkedIn more to help develop those social audiences. And it was a book that was written by the name of Sam Rathling. Uh, it's called LinkedIn Bound, Eight Social Selling Strategies to Generate Leads on LinkedIn. Um, it was published in 2018. Um, I think I saw on her LinkedIn recently that she actually is coming out with a revised uh, copy, a revised version of it. But in that book, she teaches really LinkedIn newbies everything that they need to know to really learn what LinkedIn is all about and how to use it to drive new prospects into your marketing funnel. Like it, she really is a wealth of knowledge in this area. Um, she's also on LinkedIn. Uh, so I'd recommend that you reach out, follow her as well. She often gives great advice uh, and, and great tips on her LinkedIn feed, um, but some practical advice that she gives in her book. First off, just like your website, Make sure your LinkedIn profile is 100% complete and up to date because this is where potential prospects are gonna go look. They're gonna go check you out to see what you and your business is all about. Because just like your website, you need to make a good first impression with your profile. And Sam has a whole chapter in her book 
dedicated on how to complete your LinkedIn profile. Um, if you've ever gone to look at it, um, there are several sections and she gives really good examples on what to add uh, under each section. And so for step one, if you know that your LinkedIn profile needs to be freshened up or you're just gonna start on LinkedIn, make creating your, your profile, uh, make updating your profile the top priority of your plan. Um, I've seen uh, too many poor LinkedIn profiles um, and it really is a good thing, an easy thing to fix. Um, just take some time, uh, add a picture. I can't believe how many um, LinkedIn uh, profiles have come, uh, come across and there's no picture. So you wanna make sure that there's a good quality professional uh, photo taken. Uh, of you um, as a business owner, uh, you should have good quality professional photos taken of you periodically. Um, don't use a picture where it's evident that you've been cropped out or cropped people out just so it's your your head. Um, make sure it's a good a good photo. Great first impression is what we want to be thinking of. Um, add your employment history. Add any awards that you've won, any articles that you've written. You know things that really make you shine from a professional standpoint. And, um, you know, obviously with being at Enable, we have our whole uh, social media marketing team here. They, I think, have done a really good job in helping me kind of keep fine tuning my profile. I regularly have probably anywhere between 350 and 500 people a week just clicking into my profile um, to kind of to kind of check it out. So tip number one, focus on on creating a, a good uh, LinkedIn profile first. And then once you've done that, then make a commitment to being active on LinkedIn every day. Um, this has to be made into a process and you have to spend time every day investing in your LinkedIn connections. Really, it's this idea of consistency and persistence. That's what's critical to LinkedIn, um, to LinkedIn success and helping you generate leads. And so what do I mean by you have to be active every day on LinkedIn? Um, ideally, you should be posting something to your LinkedIn feed on a daily basis. Um, daily might be a little bit too much. Um, I know I personally do try to post to LinkedIn every day. Um, I think on average, I'm probably about three to four times a week uh, in actuality posting something. You also wanna make sure that you're liking, commenting, sharing um, posts from within your network. You want to engage with other people that are part of your network to help create uh, discussions. You also want to aim to connect with 10 to 15 new businesses every day that are in your vertical or in your area that you would like to do business with. Every MSP should have their dream list of customers that they would like to have as clients, you know, whether that list is 25, 50, 100, 200 businesses. And you create your dream list and then you work to connect with them in social, in LinkedIn. Go and review their profile, review their list of employees, and then based on job titles to the ones that you want to connect with, send a personalized message to those key stakeholders, just introducing yourself. Don't do any hard sales. Don't say, hey, I'd like to have 15 minutes in your calendar. You're just going to turn them off. Um, just reach out, introduce yourself, um, that you're an MSP in the area, you focus on supporting whoever your target is. And then once you make the connection, if your connection sends you a personal message back, then maybe offer to send them something like an ebook that you may have written or a, a white paper a report that you think might have value to them and their business. Make it relevant. Um, because again, the goal with all of this, we want to start by building a virtual relationship. You know, we don't want to be aggressive. We don't want to scare them off right off the bat. Um, I can't tell you how many uh, connections reach out to me. And the first thing they want to say after I've accepted it, oh, I like 15 minutes in your calendar to sell you this. And it's like, there's nothing that's more like, not that I'm in that position, but that is a turnoff. So don't do that. You, this is a gradual, um, a, a gradual uh, relationship that you're working on building here because you want to create that level of authority with your connection base. And you're going to do that with the content that you create and you post. Because ideally you want your prospects to click on your content that you've posted. You want them to review it. Uh, you want them to hopefully like it enough to comment, maybe share on it, and then go and they're gonna check out your website to see what else you, you are about and, and what else you have to offer. Because again, business owners have that inertia loyalty. They would prefer to deal with the demo that they know uh, and they would rather put up with subpar client experience from your competitor versus the demo that they don't know. 
and that's you you know, and going out on a limb, taking a risk and moving their contract altogether to another MSP that they don't even know. So by continuing to post relevant content targeted to your desired market, the goal is, is that you're going to remain top of mind with your prospects so that they can begin to see you as an expert, as that viable alternative for when something does happen, when there's some sort of trigger event. And they're going to finally want to make the switch and maybe look at replacing their incumbent MSP with someone new. And again, you might be sitting there listening to me talk and you might be thinking that this is too much of a long game. But if you just start now, if you put a plan in place now, if you start making this a focus now, you will begin elevating the stature of your MSP in the marketplace. You're going to begin to see new leads flowing into the top part of your sales funnel, but you want to keep in mind, this is a marathon. This isn't a, a, a sprint. Um, okay, so some questions have come in. Let me go to the top. Um, if you have time, can you address the difference in relevance of posting to your personal uh, LinkedIn versus the company LinkedIn? Great question. Um, I think people still identify with an individual. Um, so I think both is important having a, a kind of having a company LinkedIn, but I think the personal is, is generally um, in my feeling more important because you're connecting with an individual at that, at that company and you're going to be a reflection of that. So when you're posting to company, um, you know, kind of just looking at what we do here at Enable. You know, we have our Enable LinkedIn. They keep it very high level from a, you know, what's the company events that they're that they're involved with? Um, you know, where are they going to be? What events are they attending? Um, what, what are some news items? What are some awards that the company um, has won? Um, you know, where are we going to be? You know, you know, where is Enable in the news? So where is your company in the news is generally what uh, we post here at Enable and what our social media is focused on versus the individual is I do kind of reshare some of the higher, you know, Enable company stuff, but from an individual standpoint, um, you know, if, if I've won an award, I will post that myself as well. Um, if I'm delivering a boot camp, if I'm at an event, um, like an Empower event, if I'm at an industry event, I will post that as well. So. It, it's you can post the same thing, but you know, personal. I'm keeping it to myself, making it relevant, more personal to to me because I'm trying to make a connection with other MSPs out in the space. Versus enable, it, it, you're you're not posting personal stuff about enable. You're keeping it more high level, company focused. Um, so hopefully that helps uh, a little bit. Um, another question that's come in: How do you balance the responsibilities? of your company page, okay, kind of this along the same line. How do you balance the responsibilities of your company page with your sales team's members' profiles? For instance, daily posting, is that the recommendation for the company page or for each of your sales teams? Both. Um, actually, I think the company, uh, we post, now we're probably using, we have a scheduler for this. It's not, you know, poor Jack, you know, sitting there posting these individually. I, we post probably, I'm thinking at least three or four times a day, you know, cause I'm, I'm on our enable Facebook. I'm on our enable LinkedIn. Um, I get emails. So I know we post as a company probably three to four times a day. It seems like, I think for an individual, I think if you can just post one a day, um, that, uh, that is good. Um, especially if it's just starting out, if you're not used to doing something like this, um, Twitter, if you're on Twitter, Twitter's meant to do a lot of posting. Like you're supposed to be on, like you can do upwards of five to, you know, 10 posts a day on Twitter. Um, but I think for LinkedIn, I think on Facebook as an individual, I think once a day is is just fine. Because again, um, I, I feel with social media between posting and then engaging, right? Like you, posting is one thing, but you just don't want to be on transmit. You want to be engaging, you want to read, you want to like, you want to share. And I think that's just equally as important than just posting um, something. So generally what I try to do is use kind of the, the first maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes of my day, first thing in the morning to get my post out and to do my engagement, to read, like, comment, share, because again, that's just as important. Um, another question's come in. Should we post on LinkedIn and Facebook with the same post or should they be different? Uh, 
ideally you can use the same idea but try and make them a little bit different because you likely will have some overlap in terms of your your followers um or what you can do is use the same content just don't post it at the same time like you know maybe you have five or six different posts you know for that month you know on the day that you're posting linkedin don't post the same thing to facebook post something else and then maybe the following you know day or the following week kind of kind of switch it um don't make it you know kind of the the exact same post um put across all of your feeds at the same day in the same time you know kind of break it up excellent questions perfect thank you for submitting them all right so then along with building out that virtual audience on social media we also want to be leveraging email marketing so that we can begin to build out um, our email uh, audience and so just as it sounds you know email marketing it's that approach we're using email uh, to deliver commercial messages to your prospect base because we're trying to promote our business we're trying to promote our services to help generate leads and sales um, there might be some of you there that are kind of rolling your eyes you know when it comes to email marketing because it is so overutilized um, it can be a real challenge to try and stand out in the midst of full inboxes but it still works. Um, there's still a lot of benefits of incorporating email marketing into your overall digital marketing plan. Um, HubSpot, you know, 99% of consumers check their email every day, and it's by far the preferred way that people like to receive updates from brands. I know personally, yes, uh, I, I agree with that. Um, I use my Gmail account, I like my promotions and uh, yeah, that's how I prefer um, businesses uh, engage with me. 73% of millennials prefer communications from businesses to come to them via email. I am nowhere near a millennial anymore, um, but again, I really prefer this approach as well when engaging with businesses that I'm, I'm working with. So these type of stats, they can't be ignored. And you know some top benefits of implementing uh, an email marketing strategy. It's very cost effective, um, especially if you are a smaller MSP with a smaller marketing budget. Uh, there was a Direct Marketing Association uh, survey that found that for every one dollar spent on email marketing, it averaged a, a forty-two dollar return on investment. Um, so that's pretty significant. When you look at email marketing. It's pretty simple to set up, pretty simple to run. You know, you kind of set up your mechanisms to collect your email address so that you can use it to build your lists. Um, you choose your email automation platform, you create your content, and then you set up your schedule to send out that content uh, on a regular cadence. It provides you a really good platform uh, and the flexibility to create personalized content. And it provides you that forum for self-promotion. So you can use email marketing to help promote your brand, promote and sell your services, share important company news. Um, you can use it to solicit feedback via polls and surveys. Um, it's also very targeted and timely. Like it provides you with the ability to reach out to the right people at the right time, really allowing you to provide more value to your audience. And it's a great way to drive additional traffic to your website and it provides you with another channel to distribute content to that you've already created. So you can repurpose some of your stuff and, 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 and massage it a little bit and use it as part of your email marketing campaigns. And then regardless of the industry that you're targeting, email marketing allows you to quickly identify and qualify warm leads and get them over to your sales team so that they can begin engaging with them immediately. Because if you think about it, anyone who's willing to opt in uh, responds to you or simply replies back with a message, they're at least somewhat interested in what you're having to say. So it's a great way to attract higher quality leads into your marketing funnel. And then another question that I do get asked quite a lot when we talk about email marketing is, you know, how can I build my email marketing list if I don't have one currently that I can use? Um, should I buy an email marketing list to get me started? My answer is unequivocally, don't waste any of your marketing budget, any marketing money on buying lists. They are very ineffective. Spend the time building your own lists instead. Because if you send emails out to a list of people whose contact information that you bought, um, a lot of your emails that you get sent out, um, they will be identified as spam. 
and um, you'll also get a uh, likely a high number of unsubscribe uh, people who are going to unsubscribe to you. And with some email marketing automation platforms uh, like Mailchimp, for example, they won't even allow you to use an email list uh, that you've purchased. You will see the highest ROI when you build out and maintain an engaged subscriber list, you know, made up of people who want to receive your messages and who have opted in by intent on purpose. They have given you permission and they have chosen to subscribe to your emails. And so, yeah, this is going to take more work, especially at the beginning, but it's the right approach. You know, going back to this is a marathon, you know, this isn't a sprint. So, what are some ways that you can look into or, or use to help build out your, your email marketing list if you don't have one today? And for the majority of businesses, websites are generally where that email list building begins um, from static embedded opt-in forms to dynamic pop-ups, overlays to incorporating specific lead capture pages like landing pages. Um, so again, that's why it's so critical to get your website flaws and the limitations resolved prior to starting any sort of marketing campaigns. Because again, having that well-designed website is going to help drive engagement and lead conversions. And so to assist with this, you know, look at creating uh, and offering some sort of gated content, you know, like a report, like an ebook, like an infographic, then go ahead and promote it on your social. And that's then going to drive visitors naturally to your website. And then once they're there, you want to have a landing page. You want to have a pop-up um, that comes up that encourages visitors to enter in their email address and other contact information in exchange for them being able to download that valuable piece of content that they're looking for. You can also look at maybe creating a monthly newsletter and incorporating a, a sign-up form on your website to solicit subscribers. And so having a pop-up or having a landing page embedded in your website for when people visit your website for the first time, because maybe they've seen something on social that you posted, that's important because hopefully then they're gonna like what they see and they won't mind providing their contact information for your newsletter so they can stay in the know about your MSP and, and your, your dealings. And I think this works really well if you make it part of your About Us page uh, on your website. Um, your About Us page, that's the most effective page in terms of conversion potential. And that makes sense when you really think about it. Like how often do you go and visit an About Us page for a business that you don't really care about, right? So ideally your About Us page will then prime visitors to want to know more about your MSP. And having that pop-up form and that, that ability to subscribe to your newsletter is a nice way where it's you're not being intrusive um you know they may not want to reach out to you right yet but you have that call to action that encourages them to sign up um so they can stay in touch and, and start to learn uh, about you um, another easy way is including a link in your email signature that can lead that prospect to your your website to your email newsletter to your blog post uh, to your ebook and then having that landing page with that call to action to again enter in your email address to download you know whatever that valuable piece of content is that you're offering um, you can also look at driving signups through your social media you'll likely have a, a faster ramp up of building up followers on social media so as you're doing that ask your social network that you're that's following you to you know are you interested in our uh newsletter stay in touch with us you know provide a link that again takes them to a, a sign up page to sign up for your your newsletter and then if part of your you know marketing plan is to do those traditional marketing activities like maybe you're attending in personal events maybe you're having a booth um you know anywhere where people are gathering don't discount the good old fashioned sign up sheet. You know, anywhere where you're surrounded by people who are into what you're doing, provide them a place to sign up and, and have them write down their email address and then uh, load it in that way so they can continue to keep up and learn more about you. Okay, uh, another question has come in. Um, any tips for balancing staying engaged with using email with avoiding the unsubscribe? 
Um, we're scared of emailing too often, causing people to unsubscribe and losing our ability to contact them. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm actually going to get on to the next slide to talk about this, but spoiler alert, don't send out more than one email a week. I think if you're sending out more than one email a week, that's where you're going to get into that possibility of being a little bit too aggressive um, and you may get that unsubscribe. But, you know, if you keep it to, you know, once a week, um, I don't think that's at all um, intrusive. And I think it's it's absolutely manageable from your end, from an MSP, because you're doing everything else from a marketing perspective. But I think as the receiver of the email um, as well. Right, good question. And at the heart of your social media and your email marketing strategy, that's where your content marketing sits. And that's what's really gonna drive the success of your overall MSP marketing plan. And so content marketing, again, that's the approach that focuses on creating and distributing timely, valuable, relevant content so that you can attract and maintain your target audience and keep your MSP top of mind until they're ready to engage with you. Now, this is a huge slide. I'm going to be spending quite a bit of time um, going through this slide. Um, I would actually recommend, if you can, take a screenshot of this as we go through it, um, because I, I, I feel that this is a really uh, important slide. And again, we're going to be on this for a little bit. But because when you think about the purpose behind marketing and the biggest hurdle to successful marketing, that's being consistent in the material that you put out there and developing different channels to promote that material on because you never know when a business owner is going to be fed up with their existing MSP and finally be ready to entertain, you know, maybe possibly going over to someone new. Marketing is all about that right message at the right time, directed at the right audience. But conversely, buyers are only going to reach out and buy when they're ready to buy. So that's where consistency and persistence is going to be key. And so that's why content marketing is such a huge component of your overall digital marketing strategy, but it also can be the most complex and I think confusing a uh, component as well, because there's just so many options to choose from when it comes to developing content. And so that's why I'm gonna be spending quite a bit of time uh, on this slide because I feel it is so important. So what you're seeing here, another version of the marketing funnel. Again, we're outlining kind of the buying journey that the customer takes from being a suspect, where they don't know you at all, they've never heard of you, and taking it all the way through to purchasing your services and becoming a loyal advocate. And there's a bunch of different marketing funnels out there, but I like this particular version and I'm showing this particular version because it breaks the funnel down into three main stages and it provides guidance as to what pieces of content work the best at each stage. And so there's three phases here. We have top of funnel activities, so tofu, so these are our activities that are focused on building brand awareness, working on building interest in your organization. We have the middle of funnel activities, which are the MOFU, uh, which are activities focused on nurturing those leads, keeping them engaged with you until they decide to make a purchasing decision. And then we have our bottom of funnel activities, you know, BOFU. And these are activities really focused on building brand loyalty, creating raving fans, um, once you've signed them on, you know, who's really going to refer new business for uh, to you. So for the today's and for this slide, I'm really focusing on the, the top of funnel and the middle of funnel content marketing um, ideas. And so going back to that salesforce.com survey that they found for 80%, 87% of business owners, they do a large chunk of their research online first before ever attempting to engage with new businesses that average business owner is going to be engaging with at least three to five different pieces of content first before they ever decide to reach out and engage with you uh, in some sort of one-on-one -on -one discussion. So again, this is where utilizing content marketing within your social media uh, marketing activities, within your email marketing activities is gonna be so instrumental in keeping your MSP top of mind and on the radar of your audience so that when they are ready to engage, they're already gonna be familiar with your MSP because of the material that you've been putting out there on a consistent basis. And again, it might seem like a lot of effort, a lot of work, it is, not gonna lie, but shortly I'm gonna be showing you how Enable can help. Um, you know, what we can do to, to aid you in all of this and make it easier for you, especially if your MSP is on the smaller side 
or if you might be limited in terms of your time, <coughs> excuse me, resources and marketing budget. But the advantage of this type of approach, by the time the prospect does reach out to you, they're already very familiar with your MSP and how you support your clients. They have read all of your educational pieces that you've put out there. They've read your blog posts. They've visited your website. They've signed up for your monthly newsletter. They're following you on social. They're engaging with you there. So this makes them an extremely qualified lead for your sales team. And that's our goal. That's what we want in the end. And when content marketing is done well, it can be a huge differentiator for your MSP. It can help set you apart from your competitors because it provides you with that platform where you can demonstrate your expertise, you can exhibit your knowledge, your authority on whatever it is that you specialize in as an MSP. And this is where you can really make your organization shine. So again, there's so many options when it comes to creating content for your social feeds, for your email marketing campaigns, for your website. And I think the trick is really trying to figure out and decide when to use which piece of content at which stage of your marketing funnel. So that's what I'm trying to summarize with this particular slide. So let's start at the top and review some of the top of funnel content strategy approaches. Again, content here at the top, we're trying to create awareness. We're trying to create interest, brand visibility within your target audience. You want to engage in activities that work to grab your target audience's attention and showcase that you are different from other MSP competitors in your space. And so some good options that we want to look at uh, potentially implementing here. The easy one, running your ads, using landing pages to send interested traffic. Um, so we're looking at things like Google uh, search ads or maybe running ads on LinkedIn or Facebook. This costs money, um, but it is one of the most effective ways on increasing traffic to your website. But if you don't have a whole big budget, if you don't have a whole lot of money, other things that you can look at. Videos. Videos get better user engagement, especially if they're short and to the point. And they work really well to help build you up as an expert in that space. You know, for completely unqualified prospects who know absolutely nothing about your MSP, videos are a really good way of communicating a lot of information in a short period of time. So you can look at considering uh, using videos to introduce yourself, introduce your company, introduce your team to those that don't know you. Use videos to document and highlight customer testimonials, uh, reviews from satisfied business owners around why they enjoy doing business with you and how you've helped them in their business success. Um, business owners really do rely on this type of social proof when they're making contract decisions because it helps to de-risk their decision. If they can see evidence, if they can hear stories of other businesses, especially other businesses in their own industry who might have benefited from your services. Case studies. Case studies are another really good way to help build up your authority and to demonstrate that you are an expert in your space. These can be written or these can be even made into videos. They can be repurposed in so many different ways. They can be added to your website. They can be incorporated as part of a blog post. Uh, they can be added to social media. And the idea here is to use case studies to really detail how you've helped your long-term customers improve their business and how you help them achieve their certain business goals. Again, we're trying to build up trust and cultivate an online virtual relationship. Pictures, infographics. Get a picture of you with some of your happy customers. Post them to LinkedIn or post a picture of you and your team volunteering in your community or helping out at some sort of local charity event. You know, pictures are fantastic because if someone is scrolling through your LinkedIn page trying to check you out or they go visit your website and they see all these pictures of you with happy customers or engaging in, in community events, this helps to build that virtual relationship and makes you seem like a trustworthy MSP to engage with. Because again, going back to many business owners, they're not going to pick their MSP based with their head. They're picking it based on emotion, who they like, who they want to deal with, who seem friendly. And pictures can really help influence that decision. Uh, looking at checklists, you know, businesses at the top of the marketing funnel, they have a problem and they're looking to solve this problem. And so if you have an opportunity within your content marketing strategy 
to try and help them solve, you know, whatever challenge or whatever pain point they're experiencing, offering like little checklists or little step-by-step -step guides are a great way um, in which you can help them. And if your guide or if your FAQ or your checklist manages to help them, then they're more likely to remember your MSP and consider you when they're looking for a new MSP to replace who they're using now. Event promotions, you know, highlight events that you might be attending or that you might be participating in in your area. Um, or better yet, maybe there's an opportunity for you to have a speaking role at this event. You know, there's nothing that garners you instant credibility than getting up on stage and speaking on a particular topic. Um, awards are received or nominations earned, like, there's nothing wrong with going and nominating yourself for an industry award to get recognition among your peers and then blog about it or post a picture of it uh, to your social media. Press releases, you know, this is where you can share any and all good news that's happening with your organization and you can use that to develop content around. So again, just some good um, targeted top of the funnel activities um, content that really works to build awareness and generate interest in your organizations for those businesses that really don't know anything about you in the first place and you want to make a great uh, first uh, impression. Now looking at the middle part of the funnel, and this is the, the, the MOFU. And so the content strategy here is a little bit different because it's all about nurturing your leads to create a deeper level of interest in your organization. Um, it's really about keeping them engaged and keeping your MSP top of mind so that when your prospects have had enough with their existing MSP, they can see you as being that safe, viable alternative that they consider as that possible replacement whenever that time happens to come. And so our content marketing strategy, our goal is really to kind of break that inertia loyalty that Paul Green likes to talk about and to lessen that risk of having that business switch over to an MSP provider. So some tactics that work really well at this stage uh, blog posts, you know, one of the best ways to build and maintain trust with your virtual audience is by exhibiting um, expertise and thought leadership. Helpful leaders usually offer advice for free. So blog posts are a great platform to use where you can offer free advice to prospects so that you can demonstrate your expertise and keep your prospects uh, engaged. White papers, reports, um, how-to guides, FAQs, eBooks, you know, these are all really useful content pieces to create an offer when you want to dive deeper into a particular topic, again, to demonstrate your expertise. And these are used because you can write more and offer more than what a blog post can offer. Blog posts are really meant to be limited between 800 and 1,000 words. Um, you can go into much deeper uh, analysis, much deeper detail when you look at a how-to, a white or, uh, or an ebook or something like that. Because interested leads who are in this middle part of the marketing funnel, they do appreciate these more in-depth and comprehensive pieces of content. And this is where you can help build up your email marketing strategy by soliciting people's email addresses in exchange for receiving one of these valuable pieces of content um, that, and, and expertise that you're providing. You know, they don't really mind giving out their email address for something that they feel they're getting a, a piece of valuable content uh, in return. Looking at webinars, looking at podcasts, you know, unlike a recorded video, a webinar allows you to interact with your audience in, in real time. It works to bring that human element into your content marketing uh, equation. And webinars and podcasts, much like speaking engagements, they have that ability to transform you into that trusted expert and that thought leader, you know, almost immediately if they're done well. And so really when we look at middle of funnel activities, anything that you can offer to your target audience that they would deem as being valuable and that they would exchange their email address for in order to acquire, you know, whatever it is that you're offering, that's a good tactic at this stage because these email addresses can then get added into your marketing database so that you can begin engaging with them uh, in your email marketing um, when you start rolling that out as well. Um, okay, just uh, another question that came in. Uh, relatively new to the MSP space and to marketing, I've caught some internal resistance concern. Uh, hold on. About from a security standpoint about posting 
with our clients on social media? Is this common or is this founded? Um, you mean posting pictures, Nathan, on social media? Um, is that what you're talking about? Because if you're going to, it's kind of the, the rule of social media, um, if you're going to post pictures of you with somebody else, um, you should always get their permission first. There shouldn't be any random you just posting um, pictures without getting permission. Um, you know, if it's just posting a picture of yourself, absolutely. But if you're, um, right, yeah, pictures with clients and referring to their names, yes, you need to get sign off. Um, you shouldn't just go and post um, and, and reference it, but you should always get permission from your clients. But once you tell them what you're trying to do, that you're posting it from LinkedIn, you're not posting it you know, to a personal Facebook page, you're using it to build out your marketing, um, your social proof is, is what it's called. Um, you know, a lot of customers you know, probably wouldn't mind uh, doing this because in effect, you're asking them to be a reference um, uh, for you. Um, and so, yeah, just make sure you get their permission and then you shouldn't have any problem with that. All right. so. Building your marketing plan. How do you now take all this information that I just went over and use it to start building out your actual marketing plan for your MSP? And so what you're seeing here um, is a screenshot of a 30-minute marketing plan template that's been created by our market builder team to help get you started on your own marketing planning process. And you can see a copy of this is made available as a handout. Uh, you can go and download your own uh, version of it. Um, and the idea with this template is to really kind of take you through all of the key concepts that we've spoken about today and give you a place to record your own thoughts, your own ideas, so that you can create an actual and actionable marketing plan for your MSP in about 30 minutes. They call it a 30 minute marketing plan, but you know, don't hesitate, it might take you 45 minutes or an hour. But the idea is, is that we want to be able to provide you um, uh, an actual plan to get started. Um, because again, this is very daunting for a lot of MSPs, especially if you're new to marketing or new to the MSP space. And so with this marketing uh, template, we're covering off you know, who your target audience is, you know, looking at, you know, who, what verticals we're going to target, what geographical locations are we going to target, you know, who do we want to target. My recommendation is that you complete this template for each uh, vertical market or geographical location that you're considering targeting. Give it its own template. Um, don't try and cram it uh, all in into one template. And then when you're thinking about your, your target audience that you're building this plan out for, then look at you know, what problems or what challenges are they experiencing that you can help solve for them. Then there's questions around your competition and how are you different from your, uh, from your competition? You know, what can you highlight about your MSP that you can build some messaging around? So again, we talked about that in, in step two, you know, crafting your message. You know, what are three or four different things that you do really well um, that's better than your competitors? And then jot down some ideas and thoughts you have around, you know, how are you going to best promote your services and build awareness of your MSP um, to your target audience? And then once you've finished answering these questions, once you've finished completing this template, then you can start putting the steps in place on how you can go about actioning what you've documented in this plan. And so this is where Enable's Market Builder platform can help you with this. Um, so uh, I know that there's people, I recognize some of the names, I know you're active users of Market Builder, uh, maybe there's some people listening today that maybe they have a Market Builder, they recall registering, but they haven't been in it in a while, and maybe there's people today that have never heard of Market Builder. So for those that maybe haven't been in it for a little while or are not familiar with it, this is our marketing automation platform. And it's available to all partners free of charge. Uh, it's included as part of your monthly subscription fee. And what this does is it provides partners with, um, I think we have over 65 now, campaigns in a box. And we provide you with on-demand marketing collateral that you can brand, you can put your own logo on it, your own contact information to help you better market and sell your services. And so we have, again, over 65 different campaigns focused on security, uh, backup, password management, co-managed IT services, the value of executive business reviews, um, all sorts of different topics, uh, different different themes, different 
uh, industries. Um, so there's industry specific, vertical specific uh, campaigns. And then for each campaign, we've created all of the necessary collateral to help support the promotion of that campaign. So we've done and created the emails for you, for your email marketing. We've created the social posts for your social media marketing. We've given you the landing pages and the call to action plugins for your websites. Uh, we've provided you keywords and key phrases to help you better optimize your SEO. We've given you sales sheets, battle cards, PowerPoint presentations, and call guides when you get to that sales um, part of it. And so what we've been, what we strive to do with Market Builder is to take the work out of having to create the content yourself, especially if you are a smaller MSP where you don't have a lot of time, you don't have a lot of energy, you don't have resources, maybe you're just not that creative. Um, or if you are a larger MSP, you know, there, I, there's definitely ones here that are attending and listening today where you have a full on marketing department or you're using a third party. You can go in and just take the verbiage, you know, use the messaging that we have and use it as a springboard and customize however you wish. You know, we can give you just the word copy, the word versions of all of the messaging so that you can put your own look and feel to it. So this really works whether you're a small MSP or whether you're a larger uh, MSP with an internal marketing de department. We also have given you within Market Builder uh, email marketing automation capabilities where you can create the campaign, load in your contacts, uh, and then schedule certain emails to be sent out on that weekly basis, um, depending on whatever schedule you want. This is fantastic if you don't have something like a MailChimp um, that you're using for this. It also has a social media scheduler built in as well so that you can create and automate the posting of your social posts to your LinkedIn, to your Twitter feeds, whenever you want. Um, again, another benefit if you don't have something like a hood suite or a sprinkler. And we're always looking for ways to improve our assets that we have within Market Builder. So if there's anything additional that you'd like to see added to Market Builder in terms of new campaign themes or marketing assets, let me know and I will get that submitted to the Market Builder design team. And so how can you actually use Market Builder to build awareness and interest in your MSP out there on social media? So Market Builder currently supports LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, for LinkedIn, it can support both your personal LinkedIn account and your business LinkedIn profile, which is kind of handy if you did want to set up and schedule to, to post to both. Um, we have, again, over 65 distinct campaigns in Market Builder. There's really new ones being added probably about once a month, once a, maybe every four to six weeks. Um, so you want to make sure that you're continually checking back and seeing what's new. So, for example, let's say we have a marketing plan and we want to develop a campaign that targets the insurance uh, vertical. And this is where we want to promote that we can help keep insurance offices and brokerage firms secure, efficient, and compliant. So when you bring up that campaign, in this instance, I'm showing you screenshots of our vertical uh, insurance vertical campaign, you're going to see that we provide you with the key messages. Um, and these are key messages that are used throughout the campaign materials so that you can communicate to your prospects, you know, what are the primary benefits? What are the outcomes that your MSP can deliver on? We also give you reasoning why you should use this campaign. Uh, we talk about who we're targeting uh, with this campaign. And then what I love, and this is relatively new, we give you the keywords that you can use to optimize uh, your website, uh, optimize your, your content for SEO. You know, for businesses that might be searching for an MSP that directly supports insurance agencies. And then lastly, for each campaign, we give you a listing of the assets that are included. And for each campaign, uh, we include a number of customizable emails, uh, landing pages, social posts for Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and again, battle cards and, and PowerPoint uh, presentations. And when it comes to building up your social media presence, it can be overwhelming, um, especially if, if you are new to all of this. Um, and I know, especially for a lot of the smaller MSPs, you know, even the larger ones, you know, you generally probably don't have a lot of time devoted in your day to it, but you do need to make it a, a, a priority. Social media should be a priority for your MSP. Again, if your goal is to cultivate more leads. So how can we make this more manageable for you? Uh, one of the best practices that I highly recommend implementing is creating a posting schedule. 
um, because when it comes to posting on social media, the more consistent you can be, the more regular you can be in posting, the faster you're going to be able to grow your connections and your followers. And I think an easy way to start with this is to download a blank calendar. Just start penciling in what you're going to post, what topics and, and when. And again, if you need content that you can use, this is where you want to leverage the social media examples that are built into each market builder campaign and use them as a springboard to get you started when you're creating your content calendar. In our insurance vertical example, we've provided you, we've created 18 different examples that you can use. I'm just showing a, a small screenshot of four, but then you can just backfill from there until you've completed the posting calendar for the month. And to further help, you may want to consider creating themes around each of the days of the week to make creating your posts and creating your schedule a little bit easier for you. You know, we've all seen them, right? Like motivational Monday, you know, hashtag tech Tuesday, you know, hashtag, you know, wisdom Wednesday, throwback Thursday, Friday fun facts, you know, that type of thing. And then be sure in any of your posts that you're creating for yourself, that you're adding in call to actions. Like maybe you're posting something about a blog you wrote or a report or an ebook or an FAQ. Always be sure to include a call to action by adding a link to your post that directs them to your website to download and view that content. And then, you know, be sure to leverage photos and videos as much as you can, getting permission, of course, because these do tend to perform best than just uh, straight text. You know, we've recently just launched uh, sample videos now within Market Builder that you can use to help round out the content uh, that you're posting on social media. And this question has already come up, but don't repost the same message across networks. Um, if you are posting to Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you can use the same content. Uh, you can use the same messaging. Just either change it up a little bit so that each post is different or just change up the days when you post it. Again, going that you maybe you have a post but it's on Facebook one day and then maybe a week later you post it to LinkedIn. You know, it's just kind of lengthen the time in between uh, the posts and in between the platforms that are being used. And then if you're still looking for content ideas, keep an eye on what your competition is doing on social media. And, and don't be afraid to maybe steal some of their ideas. Like look at, you know, what are they posting? When are they posting? Um, how's their content being received by their target audience? And look at what doesn't seem to be working or what doesn't seem to really be sparking much interest. In a lot of cases, why reinvent? You know, just use them, you know, for inspiration. And then be sure to respond to all comments, all mentions as soon as you can, because this is what's going to work to help build that relationship with those online uh, people that are going to be supporting you. And I know I've talked about this um, already, but, you know, how do you post? When should I post? Generally for LinkedIn, um, we want to post, you know, ideally once a day, but at least three to four times a week. Uh, Twitter. I don't think you can post too much to Twitter, um, twice daily, three, four times daily. Um, I'm terrible with Twitter. Um, I'm, I, I'm good if I can do it a couple of times a week because I don't like Twitter. Um, and then Facebook, I'm, I'm part of a couple of affinity groups that enable sponsors. So I'm usually posting there a couple of times a week as well. And then be sure to post at odd times of the day to avoid posting at the same time as the posting bots. Um, posting bots generally like to post at the top of the hour, the bottom of the hour, and at the 15 minutes. So try not to post during those times because then there's a good chance that your post might get lost among the noise. So you can see here on my example, we have 1228, we have 1204, we have 924, we have 907. And then be sure that you're reviewing and that you're measuring your results so that you can adjust your strategy as needed. And Market Builder can help you with this as well in its analysis section. I'm going to show a screenshot of that shortly. And then once you've created your posting schedule for the month um, using stuff that we provided you uh, and then you know any posts that you've created by yourself uh, on your own, you can load that into Market Builder so that you can automate it all and take that task off of your marketing plan so that you're actually not physically posting something every day. Um, and again, this idea behind uh, this this boot camp isn't to go into the nitty gritty of how you actually do that within Market Builder, but there's training videos within Market Builder, and our Market Builder team hosts office hours every month 
where you can drop in and ask all of those how-to type of questions around how to use the platform, um, especially when it comes for around social media and social media um, posting. And then as you begin collecting email addresses from your prospects, you can then implement email marketing campaigns so that you can begin targeting them. And um, again, tar we've already kind of discussed this, but when it comes to sending out e emails, don't send out more emails you know, any more than once a week. I think once a week is appropriate because you don't want to solicit any unsubscribes because you were too um, aggressive or you were too spammy. So for our example, for the insurance vertical, you can see that we've four separate uh, emails in Market Builder that you can use and that you can customize. Uh, and just like your social posts, you can use Market Builder to schedule and send out your weekly email. And then you can use it to see what kind of traction uh, your emails are receiving from your prospect. You know, how effective are they? Are they being opened? Um, again, not gonna go into all of that, but we have the training videos within Market Builder and we have our monthly uh, Market Builder office hours to again, help you with your usability questions. And then with your social media, with your email marketing, you wanna be able to do a little bit of analysis to see how effective each campaign has been uh, so you can see what's working and what's not working. And so Market Builder has this dashboard built into it that you can review for each campaign to give you that intel around how, how many of your prospects have opened and viewed your emails that were sent out. You know, what information um, is working? You know, what are your top uh, social posts? So again, really leverage the Market Builder office hour sections to, to do the deep dive and, and how to um, get all this set up. And then with Market Builder, uh, there's other templates, there's other content that you can use to help with your marketing, to help with your promotion that you may want to consider using, and they can be repurposed in any number of ways. Um, so again, I talked about how we have sample videos now within Market Builder that you can post to your LinkedIn, you can post to your Facebook feeds, your website, um, you can even include as part of a weekly email. Uh, we have a couple so far, um, one's focused on security, there's another one focused on backup for Microsoft 365, and I know the team is planning on adding uh, more. We have infographics um, that you can use uh, and, and post into your feed. We have sales sheets. Um, we have landing pages. You know, I've been talking a lot about landing pages, having that call to action. So we have landing pages that are SEO rich and can really help improve your organic search rates. And then most recently, we've just launched a, a newsletter a newsletter template that you can use as part of your weekly uh, emails. And so again, if you're struggling with getting your marketing off the ground because you feel overwhelmed, you don't know where to start, I really encourage you to leverage our Market Builder platform to get you started. You know, we have the content that you can customize for your social media. Uh, we have the content that you can customize for your email marketing efforts. So there's no worry if you feel that you're not a great writer or if you're not that creative, you know, and our platform has all the automation built in. So you don't have to manually do this yourself. And so to learn more about Market Builder, to learn how it works, I have a couple of QR codes here that you can see. Uh, one on the left is where you can sign up for an account if you don't already have one, um, or maybe you do have one, but maybe you haven't really logged in in a little while. Um, I encourage you to give it a visit. There's, it changes all the time. I think right now it just went through a whole rebrand and now the, there's a new homepage to it, which is much more engaging than what it was before. And there is new material being added all the time. And then the QR code on the right, that can be used to register for the upcoming monthly Market Builder office hour sessions that are held by the Market Builder team. Um, and to note, these are completely separate from my business office hours that I personally hold every month. Um, I like to think of myself as the brand ambassador for Market Builder. Um, I promote uh, the heck out of it, um, but I'm not the one that's involved in the training and how to actually use it. So that's why we have separate office hours specifically for Market Builder. All right, so just to recap, a really simple marketing plan that you can implement hopefully tomorrow, this month, um, if you wanted to. First step, you know, sign up for Market Builder, get access to all that content that you could ever need. Let us help you with that. Uh, step two, conduct an honest assessment of the quality of your website. And if improvements need to be made, make that investment, you know, using professionals to make those improvements. 
And if you are an Enable partner and you have access to our MSP Institute, go check out that special office hours recording if you didn't attend that office hours uh, that I hosted with Mark Coltman. Um, again, it's called Common Mistakes to Avoid uh, When Building Your Websites. Um, again, it's in the Head Nerd section. Scroll down, click on my picture. You'll see it listed there. Uh, and then step three, just like your website, review, update your LinkedIn profile. Or if you're not on LinkedIn, read Sam's book and get going on LinkedIn and start by getting your profile um, completed as best as you can. Work to really make that great first impression. Then go ahead and create your posting calendar for yourself so that you're posting something daily to your LinkedIn feed or social platforms and make sure you're carving out even if it's 20 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day to go in and build your connections and connect with your connections, liking, sharing, commenting on different posts that you're reading. Then on a weekly basis, be sure that you're emailing out a piece of educational content. And I think that's really also important to help with the unsubscribes. Um, you know, try and keep what you're sending out of value to them. Something that's educational is gonna help your customers. Don't make it always about you um, and maybe what you're promoting. Um, that will also help to reduce the number of unsubscribes if they just feel that they're being broadcasted to because they're being felt kind of sold to. And then monthly, and this is optional depending on your marketing plan, your marketing budget, um, on a monthly basis, maybe consider sending out, mailing out a physical something. You know, maybe it's a printed piece of collateral, maybe it's your printed newsletter, maybe it's a sales sheet, a brochure. Um, I think this works really well if you're planning on hosting an event and you want to invite people to an event. You know, sending out a postcard to invite people to that works really well. So just to kind of close up, um, you know, they do say that there are no silver bullets when it comes to marketing success. Um, I said that exactly in, in this uh, session today. There is no one tactic that's going to work better than anything else to drive leads into your sales funnel. But, you know, I'm going to kind of, you know, retract that a little bit and say, if there are silver bullets to marketing, it's going to come from having that commitment to making the marketing function a priority within your MSP. And it's going to come from being consistent in the implementation approach. Um, anybody that attended our Empower last year, we had Robert Hershevac as our keynote. And if you'll recall that he, I think he boomed it, I think he screamed it almost, you know, he proclaimed to our partners that we're about to enter the greatest economic boom in history. And he sees this as a golden time of opportunities and the best time in history to be an MSP. And I think that truly is, you know, this truly is the time to start working on your business as opposed to working in the business. And so if you're not doing any sort of marketing currently, and if your approach to lead gen has been mostly referrals up until this point, if there ever was that opportunity to start spinning up a marketing emotion, this really is the time to start. And again, if you don't know where to start, I encourage you take another listen to today's webinar, um, especially maybe, you know, part three. Um, download or make sure you've downloaded that 30 minute marketing plan template, fill it out, check out Market Builder, leverage all the content that's in there, leverage the training resources, the office hours to help you get you comfortable uh, on the market, uh, the market Builder platform. You know, we have the plan, we have the material, we have the resources to get you all going. You just really need to bring the drive, you know, to making this a priority for your business. There we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, again, appreciate your time. I do hope you found this a valuable use of your time. My contact information is there uh, on the slide. If something you know hits you tonight <laughs> in your slate, most things hit me at 2 a.m. in the morning, um, don't hesitate to, to reach out or reach out to your PSM. Uh, we're here to help. So again, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy your week, and chat again soon. Thanks.